hopefully I can share some experiences and ideas that I have in kind of the, the future of recruiting um, uh, and just kind of my view of how we need to transition into a new way of thinking and, and certainly a new behavior. Um, so I'm at uh, Alpha, which is a moonshot facility um, funded by Telefonica. Um, what does that mean? Um, well, a moonshot for us is a, I guess, a solution to big problems that society is facing. Um, there are really five pillars. Um, so the first one, it has to have societal impact for good. Um, it has to affect hundreds of millions of people. Um, 10x of value, so not 10%, 15%, that ten, tends to be innovation kind of realms. Um, we're looking for 10x. Um, so in many respects, it's invention. Um, and um, the other thing is that they have to be sustainable, so they have to have the potential to be a billion dollars each moonshot, so unicorn type uh, typing uh, projects. Um, and the other play, which we don't necessarily focus so much on, but it, it's conscious from a strategic point of view, is um, what unique assets the Telefonica have um, that helps us accelerate these moonshots. So 350 million users across the globe, 120,000 employees, you know, 60 billion turnover, fifth largest telco in the world. So it has a lot, <laughs> including Pocket, that we can leverage. Um, but I'm not coming here to tell you too much about that, unfortunately, because um, we're a stealth organization. Um, and in some respects at the moment, we're secret. Um, but I'm here, so it's stealth. Um, but it does propose a unique um, use case for us where how do we engage talent and how do we attract talent, particularly in a real talent-driven market, so exponential technology growth, so AI, blockchain, et cetera, et cetera. How do we attract those superb talent without blasting them with big PR and big employer brand. In many ways, they can't actually find us. So we've got to build targeted campaigns to engage them. And that's provoked a lot of learning, a lot of failing. Um, and some of the ideas um, that I'm going to walk through today will hopefully kind of paint a picture um, and hopefully get you guys thinking differently. So, so I'm going to talk about Cadbury. Um, so why am I talking about Cadbury? Well, I think what's interesting um, in some of the learning we've gone through is you have to look in your history um, to think about what the future's going to be. Um, and if you've ever consumed any of my talks in the past, I, I, I often go back in time. Um, and what's interesting about Cadbury, at the turn of the century, um, they did something truly remarkable at the time. Uh, they took their workers out of the smog in Birmingham and built a village. So think about an employer brand perspective. They wanted a nice environment for their employees. They didn't want them in the smog. It would help bring a better workforce and a better uh, way of life. But importantly, it built a community. They had other things outside of work that was in the area of Bourneville. They built soccer pitches, sorry, football pitches. They built tennis courts etc., etc., and they had meetups. So from an employer brand perspective, that's incredible and truly remarkable. And actually, in many respects, it doesn't happen now. But also think of it from a talent attraction perspective and a pipeline perspective. So there's a constant flow of new talent. It's sons, it's daughters, it's cousins, it's aunties. There were 27,000 people in Bourneville at the time. So it's a big, big community. But it's about engagement outside of the workforce. And Cadbury's did it well, and it became an institution. And we all know the story of when Kraft uh, eventually acquired Cadbury not long ago. And they even did a taste test in the streets where, you know, there's a real fear that the recipe had been changed. But the recipe hadn't. But it literally tasted different. Even though, but subconsciously, that's how we were behaving. So the brand really had a, a, a presence, and it, had, it resonated with a lot of people. It had a sense of belonging. And this is how we used to recruit back then. We used to put adverts up. We used to have local stores. It would often be either in the pub or in the local community store window. And we used to do want adverts. Now, actually, this is Shackleton's advert to get them to the North Pole. Pretty innovative at the time, a pretty bold statement. But it's still an advert to the local community. 
So I guess what I'm trying to say with Cadbury's is their infrastructure at the time was bricks and mortar to build their community. But we still behave the same, even though our infrastructure is digital. And think of the reach. It's not 27,000 people anymore. It's billions of people. But our behavior is still the same. We still post jobs. And in many cases, it's the only thing we do to attract talent. But that isn't how we behave on social media. That isn't how communities are built on social media. So you've got to think about how you grab people's attention in a very, very noisy place. So think of the noisiest pub and the very person you want to engage with. You've got to grab their attention. I'm just going to show you a short video which I think kind of resonates with this. I'm a big F1 fan, so it always gets a go. When I look at our car, so many faces come to my mind. Some I speak to every day as we challenge each other in the constant search for improvement. Some I see in the corridors, the canteen or the racetrack. So many individual heroes contributing to a car that is more than just a machine. It's the result of thousands of hours of blood, sweat and tears from people driven by their passion. This silver arrow is no exception. The W07 is. Screaming at the TV on a Sunday afternoon. A thousand years of fuel to 21 different countries. Building a legacy. A relentless endeavor to defy the limits. Late night calls to the US sourcing machined components. About engraving our names in the next chapter of the Silver Arrows and the Formula One history books. Our greatest challenge that's set to face is to date, and I got to make a little bit of it. 1,000 hours of engineering calculation, computer simulation, and physical testing. Our attempt at a third consecutive championship. Data analysis, creativity, and lots of hard work. Going to make me proud to work for the best team in Formula One. My 11th gearbox structural analysis. Hopefully another winner. 27 livery design concepts. A great but exciting challenge every day. Pushing for constant innovation. The end of a very long wait. 100,000 lines of code. A way for me to share my work with my wife and daughter. The opportunity to prove that it's not just luck, it's talent. Going to be a roller coaster ride. Another shot at realizing my dream the hope and hopefully the vessel that will take this team to another world championship. For me, the W07 is a team coming together as one. The W07 will be greater than the sum of its parts. Together we are W07. Pretty powerful stuff. Um, now that certainly grabbed my attention. Um, there's a couple of moments in that in that clip. So it's full of purpose. It's full of a team spirit. It's not actually about the drivers. It's not about the car. It's about the team. Uh, and the guy who talks about um, sharing his moments with his family, it gets me every time. Um, but that's something that I think you can really target people if you understand them. And it's very difficult to find them. <laughs> and you don't have to be um, Charles Xavier to find these people. You can do this within. And if you focus on personas, you can really drive targeted campaigns and engagement. So what is a persona? Well, if you think about my reaction to that video, it really kind of targets me. Full of purpose, team spirit, and the narrative around the family engagement. Is something, and if you've seen my profile, you'll understand that. So what's really fascinating is you can do this inside, and you can, you can learn and consume your teams to understand what type of content they would engage with, what type of tone of voice, um, what type of uh, things they want to explore 
long before you're transacting with them. And I'll get on to that in just a second. So in alpha, you can't quite see this, which is a bit of a shame. But this is us running a persona session um, for one of our, um, actually it became our chief innovation officer. So we did a big persona session. We understood what that person would really kind of behave with, what their motivations are, where they live, what's their name, whether they'd been to Burning Man. Um, and those who know Burning Man um, will understand the type of profile we're looking for. Um, but that helped us shape a go-to-market campaign. And remember, they can't research for us. So we have to hit them really hard. And it's with emotion. Because I believe that talent do choose brands and jobs emotionally. It's not transacting yet. In many ways, we behave transacting. And if you've seen any other of my talks, I, I believe talent is literally consuming jobs. Okay? They're going to research employers. They're going to find the best employers to work with. And it's not elitist. I believe this is happening everywhere. If you're laying brick and the employer down the road is paying marginally better with a better experience, better career prospects, you're going to go to that company. It's not an elitist thing. And it also helps you engage. It helps you understand what content they're going to play with. If you think about back to Cadbury, they were able to do this within a small, tight community. right? F football, tennis, whatever it may be. But it's about the community sharing their voice and for you to reverse engineer that. And it has to be authentic and it has to be meaningful. So in many ways, you've got to get through the bullshit. All right? It's no good hitting them with processed HR job descriptions. That's not what people engage with. It might be what they transact, but it's not what they engage with. It's certainly not what attracts them. We are still behaving in the way that we did back in the time of Cadbury. We blast one adverts just online. So here's, you're kidding me, you're not going to be able to see this. Okay, so here's a, here's a funnel. So we look at how we bring talent through the funnel. We track them on landing pages. We understand what they're behaving like with the digital assets. It's a real shame you're not going to be able to see this. So I'll walk you through it. So essentially, top one, you've got attraction, engagement, transaction, or in our language, it's interview. And then you've got onboarding. This is the same for sales. Now, on the right-hand side, at the top in the attraction, what we do, so company, we post a job description. In engagement, we ask them to send their CV and do an application form. And in transaction, we look for candidate insights, so interview competence skills. Now, on the other side, which is a shame you can't see it, the talent are looking for company insights in the interaction layer. They're looking for what's going on in the business. What's the team? What's the culture? What's the purpose? We hit them with a job description. In engagement, they want to learn about the team they're going to be working in. They want to learn about their peers, what they're doing. They can get all this on Glassdoor now, yet we, we ask them to submit their CV. And in the transaction, it's there that they're asking for the job. What's the detail? What am I doing? Now, at the interview, we're asking them to behave differently. We are literally upside down. So in many respects, when they come to an interview, they're looking for company insights, team insights, peers. They're trying to find that sense of um, understanding of the organization. At the interview, we are not giving them that detail. In many respects, we're walking them through competence interviews. So think about that from a marketing perspective. We're hitting them with the wrong things. We're not understanding the talent. We're not understanding their needs, and we're not providing it. We're not, we're not reverse engineering their needs. And it's killing the talent. They need more. And they're consuming. They're trying to consume that information. So this is what it should look like. At the top, brand purpose, company culture, office location, peer reviews, 
And that's what we give them. This is our purpose. This is what we stand for. This is who we are. And engagement, they're looking for employee spotlights. Who are your employees? Who am I going to be working with? And we give them that. And then at the interview stage, or the transaction, it literally becomes a transaction. It's, this is who I am, this is who you are, this is what I have in my skills, this is what you're looking for. It becomes a much slicker process. Because there's no, there's no disconnect. Each step of the engagement, each party has got what they need. Now, marketing teams have been doing this for a long time with customers. We just haven't cottoned onto it at scale. But it's not a linear process. They don't just drop in. Also, what we find is people share content. So I'm a Star Wars fan. So this is the trilogy storyboard because we storyboard a candidate journey. Now, what's really interesting for me is if you can see where people, there are touch points with other characters in the narrative. Well, they're your colleagues. They're your team where they're engaging with them. It might be content that they're engaging with. But if you look at um, Jabba the Hutt, for instance, he doesn't see any of the other characters right until the end in Return of the Jedi. And think about that candidate who comes in for an interview who, does know, who knows nothing about your brand, who knows nothing about your team. They come to that interview, and at that interview, they're trying to consume you. And how many times have you had those candidates who come in and your hiring manager goes, I just didn't think she wanted it enough. It's that reason. It's because they're trying to find out more about you. But if you don't behave like a marketer, you don't get that insight. To do this, you also need to adapt your teams. Your team changes. So if you can just see that in the top right, it's your employer value proposition, it's your brand positioning. Okay, that's your brand and engagement teams. That's really their majority of their time. Then it's about the social engagement, it's the content, it's the distribution to all the social channels where they might be uh, you know, metaphorically living in terms of GitHub, Stack Overflow, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those places. And as you move further down the funnel, you'll also notice hiring managers now play a bigger role in the recruiting funnel. That is something a lot of, a lot of us don't do. We don't emp empower them to do that. Yet we call them hiring managers. Fascinates me. Um, but they do a lot of the selection and interview. Now, do we have to train new managers to interview well? Yes. Do we have to align that to our cultural values? Yes. Do we have to you know, kind of give them the tools they need to empower them to do the interviewing? Of course. But it's their responsibility, not ours. Our responsibility is community building. It's pipeline gen. It's engaging the talent community. Your hiring managers are doing the transaction. It's marketing and sales. So I'm just going to leave you um, with this um, video just before I wrap up. Um, is there any Game of Thrones fans in the room? Oh, that's not enough. Okay, right. So Game of Thrones last season's just finished. We've got to wait two years for the next one. So I thought I'd get this in. But this is the case study. I'll just sort of set the scene. This is the case study um, of how Game of Thrones was pitched to HBO. So before HBO had bought the rights, this was a campaign that they took everybody on. So just watch. Game of Thrones tells a sprawling, interwoven tale of feuding families, swords, sex, deception, and the pursuit of power. But could a fantasy series become HBO's next pop culture icon? Campfire needed to create a campaign rich enough to satisfy fans of the well-regarded book series, yet simple enough to enjoy without any knowledge of the story. So we created a campaign that spoke to different audiences on different levels, and generated a groundswell of support for Game of Thrones. We began with Smell, sending influencers an intricate scent experiment that evoked key locations in Westeros. Within 48 hours, the influencers had shared the experience with their fans and followers. This is the coolest swag pretty much ever. We recreated a Westeros tavern with an immersive 3D sound experience. Visitors could navigate through the tavern, eavesdrop on the common people, 
and get a sense of the dark conspiracies taking place in the kingdom. That'd be silver for another flagon. Or two if you don't want to enter spitting And shut your trap, Jenna! Take the black and become men of the night watch. We took fans to the top of the 700 foot wall that protects Westeros. It was 8,000 years ago that Brandon the Builder built the wall. Our first person simulation let fans walk in the shoes of a guard on duty, learn the history of the wall, and feel the cold isolation of those who protect it. From icy north to sultry south, the extremes of temperature in Westeros reflect the stories that unfold there. To illustrate these extremes, we created a climate app that transports you to the region in Westeros that mirrors the weather in your location. We partnered with top chef Tom Colicchio to bring the flavors of Westeros to the streets of New York and LA. Colicchio attracted foodies in the press, and a Game of Thrones themed menu attracted the fantasy fans. Each day's dish was announced with a preview video and sent the food truck to a different location in the city, revealed exclusively to our Facebook and Twitter followers. The events had the atmosphere of a fan convention and brought Game of Thrones fans and HBO's target audience face to face for some good old fashioned word of mouth. Each experience held a deeper level of engagement for hardcore fans. A puzzle or challenge housed at themeisterspath.com. Over six weeks, fans competed and communities worked together to unlock exclusive preview clips and get glue stickers. Each challenge was symbolized with a link in the Maester's chain, and participants proudly broadcast their progress to their social networks and recruited novices to begin their own journeys. And while fans celebrated Maester's Path Mondays on Twitter, a less involved audience was able to dip in and enjoy just one sensory experience of Westeros. By the end of the campaign, we'd stirred up conversation and made fantasy relevant across tangential fan communities. And when Game of Thrones premiered, there was an organized and well-established fan culture to shape the conversation and build momentum with each new episode. Now, it's aspirational, guys. I'm not expecting to get Michelin star chefs to engage his talent. But, but what's brilliant about that, and uh, it's credit to Brian, who sat down here, who shared that with me um, a few months ago. Um, uh, Brian Adams is it, um, CEO of PH Creative. You'll see uh, Google Dave talking later. Um, but what's brilliant about that is it really kind of demonstrates an online engagement through to an offline. They'll talk a lot about fans. Well, I think that's what we should be thinking about, is how do we build this community. But there's many nuggets in there that you think are, are actually transferable to our world. So online, consuming the content, understanding what it is there. There's also the, the puzzles, the skills. Well, that's your competence interviews, right? So can you get that online? If you've just seen what Jaguar have just released for their um, e-car to try and generate 5,000 uh, AI and uh, sort of electric, electrical car engineers, they've just launched an app. All right, and you can go on there, you can hack it. Um, there's many, many ways that we can learn from, from marketing that we can transition into it. And, it, and it, it's aspirational, guys, I get it, right? But, it's, but it, you've got to start thinking about how people are consuming digitally. And it isn't about a job description. It's so much more. So what am I trying to say? Look, I get it. Job descriptions are part of our funnel. But do fear it. Think about where you're investing your money. Job descriptions and job adverts are not cheap. Can you rein some of that back in? If you think about personas, some will interact with the job description more than others. So how do you target them with different assets and different content? But think, social media is about the people. Going back to Cabri's, just closing that loop. It's about the people. It is not about your business. It's about community. It's about purpose. It's about all the goodness that Cadbury's was. And if you provide for them, if you give them value, they will come. So I'm a movie fan, as I'm sure you guessed. But if you build it, they will come. And we've been able to do this with no PR, no publicity, no forward-facing website. Persona sessions, uh, persona sessions, understand your audience, targeted campaigns, 
the right assets on digital landing pages, dropping them into your funnel, coming into our ATS. Thank you. Hmm.